Every time Sir Oswald Mosley came to Manchester, my father would disappear from the house that day, and then we would see him on television that evening, on the evening news, punching Sir Oswald Mosley. <laughs> my father claimed that he hit Oswald Mosley more than any other person. <laughs> But it did mean that uh, we would then have to go to jail to, to get my father out. <laughs> and that might be what put me off, off the political life. This is, a, this is a roundabout way of saying I'm very bewildered to be here. I speak to lots of groups of people, particularly Jews, but I've never seen you before in this formation before, or some of your faces before. And I'm alarmed by it. A writer shouldn't come to political gatherings. I'd always supposed that a political gathering was one in which a person would ask a question from the floor. You all know one another. So a person asks a question from the floor, and someone at the, at the table says, I don't agree with you, Irene. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've come to a place where you all, even when you don't agree with speak the same thing. I truly don't believe, in my heart, I don't believe a writer should be at, at, at an event of this kind, but I think it's a very important. So I have, as a writer should do, I have written some. In response to an article I wrote about the boycott in The Independent last month, a boycotter wrote to the paper telling me I'd got it wrong. The boycott wasn't about trying to gag or silence Israeli academics, it was simply about not listening to them. <laughs> A fine distinction, I thought. But it widened this distinction the more I thought about it. For not listening is an even more petulantly brutal act than silencing. A brutal act performed, not least, upon yourself. Knowingly, purposefully, and on principle, not to listen it is to wage a sort of war on your own faculties. To deny yourself, if you are a reasoning person, one of the tools with which you reason. I thought my words did not look familiar to me. <laughs> the surprising thing is that anyone would admit to this. For the moment you announce that you've stopped listening is the moment you've announced that you know once and for all what you think. And that is the moment when you cease to be a scholar or a teacher. A university that will not listen does far more intellectual damage to itself than to the university it has stopped listening to. Yeah. I'm not sure where the University of Hull stands on the boycott, but it owns a nice painting by Herbert James Draper of Ulysses resisting the sirens. As you will remember, Ulysses stops the, ear of his, the ears of his crew with wax and lashes himself to the mast of his ship so that they won't be able to hear the sirens singing. In Draper's paintings, the sirens don't just croon a cappella on the rocks, they slide up out of the water and climb aboard the ship, naked and wet, like the pussycat dolls with fishtails. <laughs> it would be nice to think that the boycotters stop their ears out of a similar inability to trust the impulses of their virility. But I doubt it. For to fear the siren singing is to admit you cannot ever be certain of yourself. And what is extraordinary about this whole business is how certain the boycotters are about absolutely everything. It is, of course, this spectacle of unwavering certitude, a certitude one normally associates with religious or ethnic hatred, when unreason battens down the mind, that makes us smell a rat. We are assured anti-Semitism plays no part in it. How could the boycott be anti-Semitic when so many who support it are Jewish? Friends, if only it were not the case, but it is, anti-Semitism was never yet a prerogative of non-Jews. <laughs> Freud noted that too long a period of study had inclined Jews towards intellectual arrogance. Well, here's something else we can be arrogant about. We even hate ourselves better than anyone else. <laughs> As for the familiar proposition, it is not anti-Semitic to be critical of Israel, I like the idea that those who want Israel closed down are being critical. <laughs> critical, a word we associate with measured argument, cool analysis, and fine distinction. I know about critical, it's my job, 
I am a critic. Being critical is when you say, the book works here, but doesn't work there. Good plot, bad characterization, enjoyed some parts, hated others. What being critical is not is saying that this is the most odious book ever written, worse than all other odious books ever written, should never have been published in the first place, must be banned, and in the meantime, should not be read. For that, we need another word than critical. <laughs> so when we accuse the boycotters of bigotry, when we say they must be fired by animosities they don't declare and perhaps don't even realise they possess, it's because we cannot otherwise understand the inordinacy of their language. An Israel which is more fascist than the fascists, more Nazi than the Nazis, practising an apartheid that exceeds the apartheid of South Africa. An Israel that is guilty of every known crime against humanity and doubtless one or two more not yet disclosed. <laughs> Torture, assassination, ethnic cleansing, colonisation, genocide, massacre, indiscriminate slaughter, and even when it can begrudgingly be seen to be retaliating, retaliates disproportionately. <laughs> this is no country that ever was outside Hades. So let them tell us, if Jew-hating is not at the heart of it, what is. In what furnace of the mind is this nation, evil beyond all others, forged? And why, in its pitiless, unheeding malevolence, does it so closely resemble the closed cosmos of the pariah Jew as it appeared to the medieval imagination? But look, let them not be anti-Semites. Let them love the individual Jew as much as they hate the Jewish agglomeration that does not at once absolve them of every crime. You can be a bad man and not hate Jews. You can be a disgrace to the profession of teaching and not hate Jews. We need a language free of issues of religion and ethnicity to describe the intellectual crime, quite simply, of picking on one nation state and loathing it above all others and against all reason, of simplifying history to fit a narrative that flatters your ideology of victim and oppressor, of imposing a Manichaean view of good and evil on events that defy such categorization and can only be inflamed by it, and of shutting down every ingress of the intelligence through which the arguments of those who think differently to you or simply want to converse with you about it, can be heard. In the end, this is not about Israel or Jews at all. It's about the way we practice thought in this country. It is about the idea we have of a university and what constitutes the free play of ideas. It is about the closing of the English mind. The boycott is our dunciad. Thy hand, great dullness, lets the curtain fall, and universal darkness covers all.